The earliest formulation of the argument for motion for God's existence can be found in the writings of the ancient philosopher Aristotle. Today, we'll take an introductory approach to a similar formulation given by Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologica, which was written in the 1200s and was heavily based on the Aristotelian concept of motion. We'll also see how the Thomistic philosopher Edward Fazer demonstrates the attributes of an unmoved mover based on this argument. Aquinas very famously begins the argument with the simple premise, it is certain and evident to our senses that in the world, some things are in motion. This motion being spoken of doesn't necessarily mean motion in terms of acceleration or velocity of a certain body or mass. It has more to do with the idea of change. Another ancient philosopher was that of Parmenides. In around the 6th to 5th century BC, he proposed the concept that things do not change. For example, as the modern philosopher Edward Fazer explains Parmenides' argument, consider once again your coffee, which starts out hot and after sitting on the desk for a while grows cold. You might say that the coldness of the coffee, which does not exist while the coffee is hot, comes into existence. For Parmenides, this was a problem as this change came from non-existence or nothingness. But something cannot logically come from nothing. Therefore, for Parmenides, change is impossible. Aristotle responded to Parmenides by insisting that change is possible by the potential and actuality of a thing. To give an example of this change or motion that Aristotle spoke of, think of a coffee cup sitting on a table. Now, this coffee cup has the potential to grow cold, but this potential is only actualized or happens in reality by the cold air around the cup of coffee. Or think of a canvas. This canvas has the potential to be painted, but it is only actualized by a painter who paints it. That is where Thomas Aquinas argues the second premise. Things only move when potential motion is reduced to actual motion. In basic terms, all Aquinas is saying here is that change occurs only when something which has the potential to change actually changes in reality to that thing. As we said before, the hot cup of coffee has the potential to grow cold, and that potential becomes actual as the cold air cools it down. For Aquinas in this premise, this is the concept of change, or as he puts it, motion. Aquinas' third premise goes as such, but nothing can be reduced from potentiality to actuality, except by something in a state of actuality. Thus, that which is actually hot, as fire, makes wood, which is potentially hot, to be actually hot, and thereby moves and changes it. Of course, in Aquinas' premise, only something actually hot can make something else which has potential to be hot become actually hot. Or to put it more simply, if the hot air around a coffee cup is potentially cold, meaning it's not actually cold at that moment, it cannot make a coffee cup which is hot, which has potential to be cold, actually become cold, because the hot air around the cup is not actually cold either. Thomas Aquinas' fourth premise states, nothing can be in both act and potency in the same respect at the same time. The key word used here by Aquinas is in the same respect and at the same time. To put it simply, the hot cup of coffee cannot be in a state of actuality and potentiality with respect to it being hot. If the cup of coffee is actually hot, it logically follows that at that same moment it cannot be potentially hot because it already is actually hot. Secondly, for it to be in a state of potentiality and actuality at the same time and in the same manner with regard to its hotness, it would in turn violate the law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction states that contradictory propositions cannot be both true at the same time and in the same sense. So yet again, the cup of coffee cannot be potentially hot and actually hot at the same time and in the same manner. The fifth premise Aquinas states acts as somewhat of a first conclusion based on the previous premises. He states, 
It is therefore impossible that in the same respect and in the same way, a thing should be both mover and moved, i.e. that it should move itself. He also states elsewhere, now whatever is in motion is put in motion by another. What Aquinas is saying is that a thing which has potentiality cannot actualize itself, or in other words, change itself. The hot cup of coffee, which has the potential to be cold, cannot actualize that potential by itself. It takes the cold air around the hot cup of coffee to actualize that potential to be cold. The sixth premise states, therefore, whatever is in motion must be in motion by another. If that by which it is put in motion be itself put in motion, then this also must needs be put in motion by another, and that by another again. The cup of hot coffee has potential to be cold. This potential is actualized or made real by the cold air around the cup. But so too does the cold air around the coffee cup have to have potential to be cold. This potential is made actual by, say, an AC or a fan in a room. But so too does this AC and fan have potential to create cold air. And it is made actual either by electricity or by the cold air outside the house, and so on. With this logic in mind, Aquinas states in the seventh premise, but this cannot go on to infinity, because then there would be no first mover, and consequently no other mover, seeing that subsequent movers move only in as much as they are put in motion by the first mover, as the staff moves only because it is put in motion by the hand. Now quickly going back to the coffee cup, the cold air, and the AC or fan, this could go back technically to infinity, as this is a linear causal chain, meaning this causal chain of potentials made actual takes place over a linear period of time. The coffee cup is made cold by the cold air. The air around the coffee cup is made cold by the AC. The AC creates cold air by the cold air outside the house, and so on. To give another reason why linear causal series are not the causal series being spoken of, think of an infinite set of domino pieces. The first domino falls forward and creates an infinite causal chain which takes place over a period of time. But even if you get rid of the first domino in the series, the dominoes in the chain will continue to fall forward. They are not dependent on the first domino. But Aquinas is not talking about this type of causal chain being impossible, or not being able to be infinite. He is talking about a hierarchical causal chain. A hierarchical causal chain has to do with motion or change in a specific moment. This causal chain does not take place over time. Think of a cup of coffee. What keeps this very cup of coffee in existence at any moment? The philosopher Edward Fager states, the potential of the coffee to exist here and now is actualized in part by the existence of the water, which in turn exists only because a certain potential of the atoms is being actualized, where these atoms themselves exist only because a certain potential of the subatomic particles is being actualized. Everything in this causal chain is dependent on each other to exist at any given moment, whereas with the linear causal chain, if we got rid of the first mover, the chain would still continue, even if the first mover of the chain ceased to exist. Now, one might begin to question or object to the hierarchical causal chain and say, why can't this chain go on to infinity, like the linear chain? The reasoning for this can be summarized in two analogies. Say there was an infinitely long set of box or train cars on a train track. Even if you had an infinitely long set without any beginning or end, this wouldn't cause the train cars to move forward. You would still need an engine, which is not dependent on anything else, to move the train cars. Or think of Edward Fazer's analogy. Again, even an infinitely long paintbrush handle could not move itself, since the wood out of which it is made has no built-in power of movement. The length of the handle is irrelevant. Therefore, if there is a hierarchical causal chain, 
that does not extend back to infinity. There has to be a first mover to this causal chain that sets all other things in motion. Aquinas states in the eighth premise, therefore, it is necessary to arrive at a first mover put in motion by no other, and this everyone understands to be God. This first mover would also have to be purely actual, meaning it contains no potentials, because if it did, then this causal chain would continue infinitely again, because something would have to actualize these potentials, and so on. But as we established, it is illogical for a hierarchical chain to have an infinite regression. Therefore, the first mover can also be called a purely actual actualizer, as the philosopher Edward Fazer names it. Now technically, this is where Thomas Aquinas' argument for motion ends, as Aquinas concludes that this first mover is what we know as God. Because of this, many are quick to object that Aquinas begs the question and does not explain how this first mover is God. The point of the Summa Theologica, where this question comes from, proves what are the attributes of this first mover in the questions Aquinas answers right after these premises. So Aquinas explains how this first mover is God later in the same writing. Using Aquinas and the modern Thomistic philosopher Edward Fazer, we'll discover the various attributes of this unmoved mover, or purely actual actualizer, and how from these attributes we can declare truthfully that this is what we know as God. Now to start off, if this unmoved mover is purely actual and has no potential to change, we can say that this unmoved mover is immutable or unchangeable. And furthermore, from this we can conclude that this unmoved mover is eternal or timeless, as it can't go from point A in time to point B in time, as this involves change. Therefore, it would have to be outside of time itself. And furthermore, it can't begin to exist or even cease to exist as this involves change. It also follows from this that the unmoved mover must be immaterial, as material things or objects have the potential to change color, shape, location, etc. Whereas because this unmoved mover is purely actual, it has no change because change is when a potential becomes actual. Therefore, this unmoved mover is immaterial because it is purely actual. Now, is it possible for there to be multiple unmoved movers, as say, in the Greek pantheon of gods, or even metaphysical objects which are purely simple? Edward Fager states, There could not, not even in principle, for there can be two or more of a kind only if there is something to differentiate them, something that one instance has that the others lack. Therefore, for each hierarchical causal series that exists, they all lead back to a purely actual actualizer, and none of these actualizers have any difference to differentiate them for each chain. Therefore, they would all have to be the same thing, and because they are all the same one thing, there is only one purely actual mover of all things. Now, based on this, this unmoved mover is the cause of everything in existence itself. Or to put it differently, this unmoved mover has the power to actualize everything in the universe. And because it has this power, it is omnipotent or all powerful as it can actualize anything. Now, does this unmoved mover have intelligence or consciousness? Well, according to the principle of proportionate causality, whatever is in some effect must in some way or other be in the cause. To give an example, if I give you coffee, the effect in this analogy is you having the coffee, which in turn came from me, which is the cause. If God, or the unmoved mover, is the cause of all material things, then in some way all material things are in God. But how is this possible if God is immaterial? The only possible way that these things exist in the unmoved mover is if they exist abstractly and are therefore immaterial in the unmoved mover. Edward Fazer states, So, what exists in the things that the purely actual cause is the cause of pre-exists in that cause in something like the way the things we make pre-exist as ideas or plans 
in our minds before we make them. One could also argue that there are two things which are immaterial, which the unmoved mover, who is immaterial, could be. The first option is abstract things, like numbers. The second is minds. But because abstract things like numbers do not have causal power or act, the unmoved mover would have to be a mind which has causal power to act. We can also further establish that since all things exist abstractly in the mind of this unmoved mover, this mover would have to be omniscient and have all knowledge of these things. From all of this, we can conclude that the purely actual actualizer is one immutable, eternal, immaterial, omnipotent, and finally omniscient cause of all things. And for this to exist is for what we know of as God to exist. Therefore, God exists. Thank you for watching, and God bless.